Morse code is a way to represent letters, numbers, and punctuation marks with sounds. Messages are sent by transmitting short and long pulses of electricity that are decoded as sound on the receiving end. This process is called telegraphy. People who send and receive these messages are called telegraphers. There are two variants of Morse code. American Morse code was used in the 19th and early 20th centuries. This was also known as railroad code. American Morse was eventually replaced by international Morse code. Some characters sound the same in both codes. Other characters have differing sounds depending on which Morse code is being used. My grandfather was a telegrapher who used the American Morse code. That's part of the reason I became interested enough in American Morris to make this video. I'm also a ham radio enthusiast, call sign Victor Oscar One Tango Tango. I was required to learn International Morris Code to get my amateur radio operator's license, so I wanted to understand how my grandfather's telegraphy differed from the Morris Code that I had learned. Will Lincoln Brown learned his telegraphy skills in the village of Versailles, Cattaraugus County, New York. Telegraphy was important because his father, Elisha Brown, was postmaster and owned a general store. Both functions benefited from Will's knowledge of telegraphy. About 1905, Will accepted a job as a telegrapher for the East Ohio Gas Company in Jackson Township, Stark County, Ohio. The telegraphy building was located on a piece of land known as Gross Farm. The location of his telegraphy office is now part of Dominion Energy's gas pipeline compressor facility known as Robinson Station. Will and his family built a house at a nearby location that is now known as Lego Springs. The purpose of Morse code is to provide a way of matching each letter of the alphabet, as well as numbers and punctuation marks, with a unique sequence of long and short electrical pulses. A pulse is called a dot, and a long pulse is called a dash. The sending telegrapher creates a series of short and long electrical pulses that are sent to the receiving telegrapher, where these pulses are translated back to the associated letters, numbers, and punctuation. A simple switch is used to create the short and long electrical pulses. This switch is called a telegraph key. The telegrapher uses his or her hand to press down the finger pad on the key. This makes an electrical contact and closes the circuit. When finger pressure is released, a spring opens the key's electrical contacts, thereby breaking the electrical circuit. In the very early days of American Morse code, a receiving device printed a tracing of the electrical pulses on a strip of paper. The telegrapher would look at the tracing and translate the series of markings, that is, the dots and dashes, to letters, numbers, and punctuation. It didn't take long before some telegraphers realized that the electromechanical relays within these machines produced a sound that was synchronized with the timing of the electrical pulses being received. The sound alone became sufficient to translate these sound pulses to letters, numbers, and punctuation. Paper tape receivers became obsolete and were replaced with sounders. Sounders were receiving devices designed so that a click sound would be produced when a solenoid was energized and a clack sound would be produced when the solenoid was de-energized. Telegraphers became able to translate the click-clack sounds to letters, numbers, and punctuation in real time based only on listening to the sounder. Let's jump forward for a moment to the present day. In order to understand what 19th century American Morse code sounded like, it's helpful to first understand the sound of modern Morse code, commonly known as CW. Here's a sample of how the words Morse code would sound in CW. For comparison purposes, let's listen to what those same two words sound like using American Morse code and a sounder. (laughs) 
CW is received by an electronic device that converts the electrical pulses forming the code's dots and dashes into audible sound. The sound is played through a speaker or headphones. The tone is a pure sine wave of a frequency selectable by the telegrapher. Typically, 500 hertz sounds like this. 1000 hertz sounds like this. Short duration tones represent dots. Long duration tones represent dashes. CW is generally transmitted wirelessly, so the receiving device is generally a radio. The audible CW dots and dashes are mapped to letters, numbers, and punctuation using international Morse code. With sounder-based telegraphy, the situation is different. Audible clicks and clacks are produced using a solenoid to bang a metal arm against two different pieces of metal. When the solenoid is energized, it produces a click. When the solenoid is de-energized, it produces a clack. The length of the time interval between the click and the clack determines if it's a dot or a dash that's been received. Sounders were connected to wires. These wires were often called landlines. Sounders were in their prime long before wireless communication was possible. Telegraphers who used sounders also used American Morse rather than International Morse. Let's recap. We've learned that International Morse, aka CW, is generally associated with audio oscillators. These produce single frequency tones. American Morris, a.k.a. Railroad Code, is generally associated with sounders. These produce clicks and clacks. Both codes use their respective hardware to convert text, that is letters, numbers, and punctuation marks, into audible patterns of dots and dashes. The conversion process involves two equally important steps, mapping and timing. Mapping is the assignment of a unique sequence of dots and dashes to each letter, number, and punctuation mark. Timing determines the duration of dots, dashes, spaces, letter gaps, and word gaps. Here's an example of how mapping works using the letter F. Note that the dot-dash sequence in International Morse Code is not necessarily the same sequence that's mapped to that letter in American Morse. Tables such as the one partially shown here are widely available on the internet. These show the dot-dash mappings for both International and American Morris. The timing of both International and American Morris is based on the duration of the dot sound. A dot is said to equal one unit of time. The duration of dashes, spaces, letter gaps, and word gaps is then set equal to some multiple of the dot duration. The actual duration of a dot in seconds depends on how fast the telegrapher is sending his or her code. A dot would typically last around one-tenth of a second. It's probably worth noting that present-day CW operators tend to avoid using the words dot and dash. The terms dit and da are used instead. The reason for this is that Morris code should always be learned by listening to sound patterns. The telegrapher's mind should always translate sound patterns directly to text. Never let your mind translate sound to a mem mental image of dots and dashes and then to text. Beginners often make this mistake. By using the terms dit and da, it is possible for the human voice to mimic the sound of international Morris produced by an audio oscillator. Here's what the word Morris sounds like when spoken using the terms dit and da. Da 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 dit 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 dit. But with American Morris and a sounder, dit da makes no sense. That terminology is designed to mimic the sound of pure tones produced by an audio oscillator. Sounders produce clicks and clacks, not pure tones. As a result, the words dot and dash are still the most appropriate terminology to use in connection with American Morris and sounders. For simplicity's sake, I have used dot and dash throughout this video, even when discussing CW and International Morris. Let's examine the details of Morris code timing. As previously mentioned, the dot is the basis for all other timing. 
It's defined as one time unit. The duration of a dot is approximately one-tenth of a second when transmitting ordinary text using International Morris at 12 words per minute. As seen here, International Morris has a total of five types of timing, dot length, dash length, the silence between dots and dashes, the silence between letters, and the silence between words. American Morris adds three additional types of timing. <clears throat> a long dash, an extra long dash, and a long silence between dots and dashes. Notice also that the dash in the International Morris is three times the duration of a dot, but in American Morris, the dash is only twice the duration of a dot. American Morris is more complex than International Morris and more prone to reception errors. For example, the American Morris letter O is a dot followed by a long element space followed by a dot. This is easily confused with the letter I, which is a dot followed by a normal element space followed by a dot. The letter O can also be easily confused with double letter E's. Another way to understand the timing of Morse code is to compare the audio waveforms produced by the CW oscillator and the American Morse sounder. In fact, if you are paying close attention to the opening 20 seconds of this video, you may have noticed a screen crawl that displayed waves forms and sound for the phrase, this is Morris code. First in American Morris, then in International Morris. But let's zoom in to focus our attention on a single letter. Here is the International Morris letter A as an example. First the dot sound, then the dash. Next is the same letter in American Morris. First the click, then the clack. Here is the sound of the letter at a standard timing in both codes. International oscillator first, then American sounder. The most interesting thing that I learned from preparing this video is that the telegraphy my grandfather used sounded much different from the Morse code that I had to learn to get my amateur radio license. I knew there would be some differences going into this project, but I was surprised by the number of ways in which 19th century Morse code differed from the CW used in my amateur radio today. As a closing tribute to Will Lincoln Brown, here is the alphabet as he would have heard it.